Hello. I'm uh, Russell Andrade. Uh, some of you may have seen me at the uh, Super Session. So anyways, I'm gonna be doing an intro to the BlackBerry 10 native SDK. Um, so there's a lot of different things I wanna cover and I want, to, I want you guys to see this as sort of a concepts kind of a, a session where I'm gonna be throwing a lot of different ideas and, and concepts on how to sort of develop a Cascades app. Um, the, first, the first kind of half of this uh, session is going to be on just a native SDK and what's available within it and how you go about uh, starting development on the native SDK. And then uh, for the second part, I'm going to take you through the development of a Cascades application. And I just want you to get familiar with some of the concepts and related Cascades and QT so that, you know, you, you then have the basics in place so that when you attend some of the more advanced sessions, you, you have that sort of background. Um, if you're really new to native development on BlackBerry, some, some of the things, you know, it, it may be a lot of information, but uh, as you, over the next couple of days, as you attend some of the sessions, a lot of it will sink in. So a lot of this is just to give you kind of a high level map of uh, what you can do with the SDK. The first thing I like to do is just, you know, take a step back and look look at it from, you know, look at our BlackBerry 10 uh, software stack from a from a 10,000 foot kind of uh, level. We actually support four different uh, SDKs. Uh, native is just one of them, and this goes back into our approach towards having an open platform and making sure that whatever language or whatever, you know, whatever sort of uh, functionality you want to harness, we have the right SDK for your needs. Uh, so, you, so if you're an HTML5 developer, we have the WebWorks platform. If you're, if you're an Android developer who doesn't want to spend a lot of time you know, porting the apps over, we're supporting Android. And then for all the playbook developers who are using Air, we have the Air runtime. We also, uh, the other thing is, you can write an app that actually leverages multiple uh, SDKs, right? So you can write a, a you know, WebWorks app that uses a lot of native APIs. So if, if you want your front end written in HTML and then you want to use native, native at the back end, you can do that. You can also write a native app that uses WebWorks. It's kind of funny because when I developed an app that I'm going to show you. It's, it's kind of a picture viewer app and then it invokes a picture card. And the funny thing is we have a native picture card that we've sh we're shipping with the dev alphas, but the irony is it wasn't working until, until like Sunday night. So my app was just not working when I reported it to the dev alpha, and then one of the web developers, like, you know, just a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of rows down, he was like, well, I, I wrote a card, a picture card using HTML. So I basically was like, okay, okay, let me, let me just uh, go and invoke his uh, web card uh, in my native app. And, and, you know, so um, so you can you can mix and match sort of runtimes as well. So there's a lot of power in in what we're offering. So we don't think native for everyone, but there's certainly some developers, some personas who we think are ideally suited to the native SDK. The first is the Objective C developers. Um, if you're an iOS developer and you're using a lot of Objective C. Uh, I think our native uh, SDKs are really the closest match. You know, uh, moving to C and C++ is not going to be a, a, a huge sort of undertaking. The game developers, of course, will also like the native SDK because they like to code using OpenGL and OpenAL and all these, you know, lower level kind of C routines and, and um, you know, harness the power of the GPU and the platform. So I think those guys will also like to write, you, you know, develop their apps using the native SDK. In general, our approach towards developing APIs is it first arrives at the native SDK before it kind of you know, makes its way up to the other uh, runtime. So if you really want to stay on the, on the kind of the, you know, stay ahead of the sort of technology curve in a sense, uh, you're better off you know, using the native SDK because you're gonna have all the APIs arrive there first. We, we're doing a pretty good job of making sure they arrive you know, in some of the other runtimes as soon as we can, but certainly there's functionality prov you know, provided in the native SDK that's not available in some of the other runtimes. And then we've talked about you know, some of this deep integration and with the services and the platform and the technology, and once again, you get a lot of that in Cascades and, 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 and native. 
And finally, you know, someone asked a question, the super session, you know, what, what do I do if I'm a Java developer, right, in my, on, my, on the previous platform? So, so we really think that they should seriously consider uh, the native SDK. C and C++ is not Java, obviously, but um, those types of developers, they, they really used our Java platform because they wanted a custom sort of BlackBerry experience, and you're gonna get that using the native SDK more than you would any other runtime. So I sh I've shown this slide before, but you know, it's just a point that needs to be emphasized. Cascades and core native are really part of one NDK. And you know, when, when I'm speaking today, I'm gonna be talking about you know, the NDK as a whole that includes Cascades and, and core native. Um, I'm not gonna focus too much on core native because mostly it's the game developers are interested in that, and I suspect most of you are more interested in the Cascades side of things. But you can use whatever API is available in each layer. It's basically a layered kind of architecture, and Cascades is sort of like the frosting, right? It's a UI framework that's built on top of this core. Um, and of course, the core native layer, it's a POSIX compliant layer, which, uh, which supports a lot of the open APIs that sort of some of the game, the game houses and the game developers want to use. There'll be certain situations where there's APIs that are not available at the Cascades layer, and in that case, uh, you, you may have to sort of go down to the core native layer to access some of that. So what can you do with Cascades? Well, uh, you have your stunning UI and your interactions and the flow that, we, that we've already been talking about and you've been hearing about. You, you can do animations, styling, and layout, and it's very easy, as you will see. Um, using QML and Cascades. Our Eclipse, our ID has an Eclipse plugin, so you can get the ID from the web, from our, you know, our website. And with the ID, you can build these Cascades, uh, these Cascades components very easy, and you can even view them using the ID, so you don't even have to download it onto the device. And then, of course, we have a lot of Cascades platform APIs. These are these Qt APIs that we've talked about. You know, Qt mobility, all these mobility APIs, camera, invocation, and these allow you to harness the, you know, the power of the actual platform. So, you know, a lot of stuff uh, for you, uh, you know, at the Cascades layer, and I think, I think you'll have, like, a, f uh, a great time just exploring some of the possibilities. So what about the core native layer? Well, the core native layer, it, it provides the commonly used tools and, and libraries. It's like, once again, you know, I, I, I emphasize a lot, but it, it, it's, it's a game developer's kind of a heaven. We have score loop at that layer. We have, you know, OpenGL, uh, some of the social gaming features. So, so those guys, they, they don't care about developing a UI. They, they create a full screen window and then they kind of load their game, right? So that's, that's kind of the nature of uh, what they do. It is POSIX compliant, so if you're actually porting a framework, uh, and we do have people who actually want to port entire frameworks on, um, then you'd probably want to do it at the core native layer, so you can, you can port whatever framework you want, really. And then if you want the integration with some of the hardware peripherals and protocols, you will get a lot of that at the core native layer. So I guess then the thing is, well, you know, if you're writing an app, like, what do you code, right? Like, you use C or C++, right? Commonly asked question. So you'll see a lot of duplication of APIs between both sort of core native and Cascades. Um, and, you know, the core native uh, layer, it's exposed right now at the C, where, you know, all the C functions are exposed to the core native layer, and then you have all the Qt-based functions for Cascades. As a rule of thumb, I suggest that if you're a Cascades developer, you should first look to the Cascades APIs and the Qt APIs when writing your apps. And if you're a game developer, then you, then you should try to use some of the C APIs. There are certain functionality, like security, like our crypto APIs, they're all written in C, so, so in, in certain cases, you, you may have no choice, but that's sort of a general rule of thumb that I would, uh, I would recommend. So we've talked about some of the APIs, right? And you'll see a lot of deep dive type sessions over the next couple of days. And I just wanna give you, uh, and I have two slides on APIs, so like I'll, I'll, I wanna just show you some of the examples of the functionality you now have in the native SDK. So uh, we just released a whole bunch of the messaging APIs. So I know there's a lot of people you know, commonly asked, you know, when are we getting email, calendar, contacts? So we have it now in the new beta, BBM, right? Huge, huge. Uh, uh, you know, f functionality. 
uh, we have a very powerful platform API. Invocation's a big thing, and I'm going to show you how to sort of use the invocation framework a little bit. You know, it's not, not, not in too much detail, but you know, it's important you understand that. Uh, a lot of cool APIs in the wallpaper, and you, know, you have push uh, as well exposed. Uh, we have the connectivity APIs, uh, then a lot of APIs to access different like hardware, like the vibration, LED, battery. So really, if there's any hardware component you want to access on the device, we now have APIs for it. And there's more, right? So uh, the multimedia guys are going to like the camera and the media. And it's very easy to use a camera API. You'll see, uh, you'll see in my example. Uh, you know, a lot of app developers also care about monetization, right? So you want to know how can I build app, you know, advertising in my apps, right? So we have an advertising API, payments, score loop. Um, if you, you know, you can do things like virtual currency with with that type of functionality. Uh, we have a whole set of QT location APIs, um, data and info, like you want system related information, like what's a device ID or something like that. We have that functionality. So lots and lots of different uh, functions. And this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, right? I just couldn't list you know, uh, you know, all the functions available in, in, in two slides. But it should give you an idea of some of the high level you know, functionality that you have access to now. And if there's things you need, I mean, I'm the product manager, so definitely schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me. And I'd love to talk about some of your, some of your needs if, if you see something that you think is missing. So after talking about you know, all the different things you can do with it uh, in terms of APIs, I just want to quickly walk you through setting up the NDK. And there is a lab on it, so I'm going to sort of go at a high level through it just to give you sort of an understanding of what you need to do. Um, so the first thing you need is a BlackBerry ID. So you register through our website and you get it. Uh, very simple. Um, you know, we, we've tried to make this as easy as possible, not like in our previous kind of platforms where it was a, a lot more difficult. You get a signing key, and usually you kind of fill in this form. They'll send you these signing keys. You'll see these .csj files that are very important. So, so keep whatever they send you, uh, send you back, uh, because you'll need it later. And then you download our SDK and simulator. If you have one of these like dev alpha devices, you don't really need to download the simulator, and that's why we've kind of we have a separate download for it. But for many of you, you may still want to have the simulator. Just it might be easier to just deploy and debug your apps using the simulator before you test it on the device. But you don't have to do that. Like I, I like using the device myself a, a lot. And and before you're ready to write an app, you also kind of need to configure the device for deployment of your app. And it's actually quite, let's see if we can. So I'm just going to quickly show you how you do it. So you just kind of, it's a gesture. You just put your finger down. There's a settings. And then you'll see your security and privacy. And then you'll see development mode. And then you just toggle the switch. I don't know if you can see it very well. But like this on off switch. And ask you for your password. And then there you go. Once Then it's in development mode. So now you can deploy apps onto your device. Can I get back to the? And I also have kind of a, just like a visual of, of the steps needed. I just thought it would be kind of nice to show you as well. Um, so once, once, so that once you do this, your device is ready for development. Go ahead. This one? It's a dev alpha. The one that I demoed? It's a dev alpha. Yeah, so the, uh, the guy, he asked, uh, this device doesn't look like the BlackBerry. It's actually the dev alpha, the dev alpha A that we're giving out in, you know, at this conference. Um, it's the same on the, on the previous dev alphas that we were giving out. The same. OK, all right. Yeah. This is kind of how our dev alphas look, the, the recent one, in case you guys haven't seen it. On the tooling front, and once again, I don't want to go through every little step. If, you're really, if you really feel you need practice at this, there, there's an intro lab that can, can walk you through it. But essentially, you, you know, once you install the IDE, it takes you through like a setup page. And then you just walk through the wizard. And it'll, 
you know, and you need, you know, when you signed up, you got those CSJ files, you'll need them to sort of uh, set up your debug tokens and then deploy apps onto the device. So once you do that, then your ID is set up for development. So I want to talk a little bit about the bar descriptor because that's kind of an important like concept. Um, so the, the apps that you develop are packaged in something known as a bar descriptor, like in, in something known as a bar file. And it really contains the executables as well as all your assets and images and all, all this information pertaining to your, uh, your application. You don't necessarily need to understand the entire bar spec and the details, and, but there's a couple of key things you'll need to understand. One of them is permissions, right? So some of the key things that you need to edit in the bar descriptor are available through the tooling. And one of them is these permissions. So if you're using certain APIs, we have access control related to them. Like, like for example, let's say you want to use a camera API or, or, or file system API. You need to set certain tags in the bar descriptor to, for the APIs to even work. So that's kind of a little bit of a security precaution because we don't want some app to uh, be just you know, using the camera and taking random pictures of someone. So when you set these permissions through the bar descriptor, and you download the app onto your device, the first time your app pops up, it'll say, this app wants to use a camera, or this app wants to use my file system. And when you do that, then, and when you click OK, then the app will run, and of course, the settings are saved. So the next time you go through it, you, know, you don't have to go through that process. So just keep in mind, it's likely if you're using some of the APIs, you will need to get familiar with some of the permissions involved. And then we go to sort of the creation of actually a Cascades app, right? So, so it's really quite simple. Um, through the IDE, you have this. You can just do a file, new BlackBerry Cascade C++ project, and we offer a whole bunch of templates. Um, what, I, what I show you in this session is going to just be, you know, I'll walk through the standard empty project. Um, if you, you know, once you start doing some more advanced stuff, you can, you can use some of the other templates. It's really quite simple. And when you go through this, it's actually going to create a project that compiles and runs. So it's a good, it's a good kind of first test, especially if you're, if you're new to the platform. You know, create the empty project and, and run it, right? And if you have compilation errors or anything like that, then there's something wrong with either your download or your setup or, or, or something like that. And this, this app will print hello world on the screen when you, when you deploy it onto the device. And um, you don't have to change any code for it, for, for it to do that. So I just want to sort of walk you through a little bit of some of the concepts related to, you know, like the anatomy of a Cascades app, right? What's, what's involved in, in kind of a Cascades app and, and, and doing a hello world on the screen. So when you create this empty Cascades project, it's going to sort of create uh, multiple files, but the two key files that I want you to know about, one of them is main.cpp, uh, and the other is uh, main.qml, right? So main.cpp, it's kind of the entry point to your Cascades application, and it includes a whole bunch of header files. Um, it also you, you know, includes like the namespace. Application is the actual sort of object that starts the server and, and handles all the event handling and, and the application loop. Um, and this is all generated, by the way, by the MT Cascades project. Then you have some code related localization. So this is if you want to deploy your apps in multiple countries and multiple languages, you'll have to worry about localization. I'm not going to go too much into, into localization here. And then these lines here are pretty important, right? So Cascades itself is a scene graph, right? And it, you, like any user interface uh, you know, involves like a scene graph. And a lot of the scene graph is defined in your QML code. So if you look at that first line, the QML document, that basically specifies my QML file, uh, and it, it basically advertises the QML file to my C code, right? So if you have a main.qml, like in this case, it, it, it links it in into my main code. If you create additional QML files, you will have to you know, do a QML document create. Then the next is a root uh, object for the UI, and I'll be talking a little bit about abstract panes in a bit. But basically, the, the second two lines, uh, creating the root and the set scene, you're really setting the scene to the, to the root of your scene graph, right? The page that you want to display the moment you load up your app, right? And, and, and so you need the set scene in order to actually visually see something on your screen. And then, of course, you have the execution of the application. 
So then, you know, the, uh, the question is, you know, what is QML? And, and for those of you who are, you know, never use Qt, you know, Qt may kind of not be familiar with, with QML, but basically it's a modeling language. It's, it's a lot like other modeling languages like HTML, for example. It's a declarative language that's based on JavaScript. So if you're familiar with some of the other, you know, well-known declarative languages out there, like it should be not a problem uh, playing around with QML and figuring it out. It was really designed as part of Qt for creating user interfaces, uh, and Cascades uses a subset of QML, right? So we don't, we don't, you know, we don't uh, support the entire QML language, but we do support a subset for creating your controls and some of your logic. So obviously, as, a, as an app developer, you, you, know, you can do things using QML, you can do things using C++. So you know, how do you figure out how to partition your code? What goes in your QML files? What goes in your C++, right? So in general, everything that can be done in QML can also be done in C++, right? So Cascades is totally based on C++, and everything, all, all the QML that you create is eventually represented by C++ controls. Typically, all your apps will contain a mixture of QML and C++, right? And you know, once again, a rule of thumb here is you should try to use QML for the user interface. So you know, defining your scene graph and your buttons and your and, and your uh, controls, and then you should use like C++ for the application logic. Um, and there's sort of a gray area because what if the application logic is really simple? Well, then you can have some of that in QML. And I'll show you examples of you know, having some of this logic in C++ while having some of it in QML. So it's once again, as a designer, you'll have to figure out you know, what, what makes sense for your application. So now that I've talked about main.qml, here's how, uh, how's, how a QML looks. So this is back to the empty cascades project. And you saw that hello world being printed on the screen. So well, that's what printed out the hello world. There's a label there and the text, and when you have a label, it basically contains text that you then send to the screen. I also highlighted a few other keywords that you should be familiar with. One is a page, and one is a con and, and the other is container. So I look at Cascades as a, so let's say your, your application is like a book, right? And a book contains pages, right? So that's basically a page is like a view within a Cascades app, right? And you can have tabs, for example, so every tab contains a page just like a book, right? And a container you can look at as a paragraph. A container is used to you know, group the controls together. So if a control, if, you, if, you know, if one of the controls in the, if the container is destroyed, then the controls within that container also get destroyed. So, so if you want to group you know, controls together, then you need to specify them within a container. So obviously you can have multiple pages per app and you can have multiple containers per page, right? And I'll show you an example of how you know, how with, you, with a, a two-tabbed app, you can kind of have two pages. So you saw that, you saw that reference to the, so the abstract pane earlier on, and you know, so a page is basically a screen within the application, and interestingly enough, you can do multiple things. You can have, for example, tabs in your application, so you, you, you can kind of go from one tab to another. You can also have this, you know, we talked about some of the flow, right? So you can actually have navigation panes where you have one kind of page that slides on top of the other and another page that slides on top of the first one. So you can really have a single page application or you can have applications containing, you know, these navigation panes or tabbed panes. And once again, it's very easy to do um, using cascades and QML. Um, and of course, then I talked about containers and how they're used for grouping controls and other containers. So I'm going to briefly touch upon layout because that's, uh, um, you know, for any Cascades app, you need to understand a little bit about, you know, how, you know, what layout, right? So we actually support three types of layout currently. For the most amount of flexibility, and, and the default layout is, is a stack layout, right? So let's say uh, you specify stack layout and you have three buttons, for example, right? Let's say I move the middle button. What happens is the third button stacks on top of the first button. So if you really don't care about you know, a fine granular control of your layout, then you know, the stack layout is probably the most appropriate for you. If you care a little bit about some, some degree of control, like you want to have a button in a certain place and you don't want it to move and I remove another control or component, then, then you should use a dock layout where you're saying, okay, I want my control to be on this part of the page. 
And of course, if you really, really, really want uh, a high degree of control, you can use absolute layout by saying, I want it at this pixel, right? The danger, of course, with using absolute layout is as you move to devices with different LCDs or you move your app to a tablet, then you know, you're gonna have to do this work yourself to kind of uh, you know, redo the app for, for, a, for a different screen size, right? So just be careful which layout you use, you know, depending on what, you know, how much versatility you want with your application. Uh, good question. So what we've, so the question is, are we going to have specific screen sizes or a wide variety of screen sizes? So, so we are basically standardizing. Okay. So in this dev alpha, we kind of have a 1280 by 768. And what happened there is we were pretty far down the hardware cycle. Uh, so we couldn't really change it, but in the future we are standardizing on 1280 by 720 and 720 by 720 for the keyboard-based devices. And we, we are gonna to try to keep those resolutions constant for, for as long as we can. I mean, obviously at some point technology moves and you, know, you get into this race with respect to you know, how many pixels, but we're trying to standardize you know, 1280 by 720 uh, for the white screen and 720 by 720 for the, for the square. But as I said, we, in, this, in this device, in this first device, it's going to be 1280 by 768. So. There's a little bit of work there, unfortunately. Oh, that's, I mean, that, we, don't, we don't have a date as yet. It's gonna happen later. Like right now, we, we, we have kind of focused on the first set of the first series, but the, the, the keyboard devices will be coming shortly after, right? After the first set of touchscreen devices. So what can you do from, from the perspective of controls, right? So, I mean, we have all kinds of cascades controls and we're keeping on adding controls in them. So you have your buttons, your labels, your lists. Uh, you have some really more advanced controls like a web view. Uh, if you wanna draw OpenGL code within your app, like you wanna do a fancy clock or something, you can actually create a foreign window within cascades. Um, you have a text field that can also, you can also specify the format for the text that goes in, like an email address. So, so a lot of like a, a lot of controls that we are providing, and this is not the entire list. I just wanted, you know, it's just a representative of the kinds of things uh, you have access to in your Cascades app. So I wanted to sort of then go through kind of the development of a Cascades app, and first I kind of wanted to demo the app so you can see sort of what the app does. And I wouldn't mind a volunteer, actually. That I can take a picture of. All right. God, you, you wanted a volunteer? OK. All right. So first, let me just show you what the app, it's kind of a camera app, and it has two tabs. And the first tab is kind of like the camera tab, so I can use it to take pictures and, and stuff like that. And then the second tab, we can view the pictures and access the file system to retrieve the pictures. And then you can set the pictures, the wallpaper, as well as invoke a picture card to kind of view the picture. And I'm gonna show you how you do it. So why don't I invite this brave man? <laughs> Hopefully it'll work. You know, you're gonna be my wallpaper, right? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So now after taking a picture, I'm gonna go in the second tab and I can kind of view the picture. So it's the last picture that I took. And when I go, and notice how the view a button also kind of gets enabled when I selected the file. And then I'm gonna view and it brings it in as a card. I don't know if you saw that. And you can kind of so we've talked about some of the flow, right? And honestly, you'll see it's not hard to actually implement some of this. Um, and I'm not even, I didn't even develop a picture viewer, right? There's a picture card on the system that I'm invoking to kind of show, show the picture. And then, you know, let's say I want to set, set the picture as a wallpaper because I like it. So I can set it as a wallpaper. And there you go. He's now become, he's now become my wallpaper, you can kind of, <laughs> so how do you go about developing something like this? And um, obviously now we're gonna get into some technical stuff. Uh, 
the idea is I don't want you to necessarily, the idea is not to be sort of teaching you how to code or anything, but I just want you to be familiar with some of the important concepts involved in developing an app like this. Just to raise your hands, like how many actually have experience with Qt and QML? Just to, okay, so there are, there are several, all right. So I guess the first, the first things that uh, I would do is, you know, you create a Cascades project like I showed you. In the bar descriptor.xml, uh, you select those permissions, right? So as I said, some APIs have certain permissions. In this case, I'm taking a picture, so I'm using the camera, and I'm also, the picture's being saved on the file system that I'm trying to retrieve later. So it's very important that I set these permissions. And so when I was developing this app in the last couple of days, and you know, you're kind of in panic mode because of the conference, so I kind of developed the camera app separately and the picture viewer separately, and then I brought my camera app into the picture viewer app, and I forgot to set the use camera. When, so it was kind of working the camera app where I set the use camera flag, and then I forgot to do it. And obviously, for a while, I was like scratching my head because you just see a blank screen, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's something, it's a good rule of thumb to look at those permissions in your bar descriptor. And then you include whatever libraries you need for like the wallpaper API and the camera and, and stuff like that. And, you know, it's a dot profile that you get there. So how do you create tabs, right? So we talked about abstract panes and how an app contain, can contain multiple pages. So here you go. Here's, it's as easy as possible, right? This is all the QML you need to create a tab, right? So you basically, you have a tabbed pane in your QML, and I've had my two tabs there, um, and I've, you know, I've given them, you know, I've called them camera and view, and I've also given them sort of an ID, and you'll see that later why I do that. So it's pretty straightforward how you, how you can create sort of, uh, you know, tabs in your app. I'm not gonna show you all the class definitions, but I wanna just show you an example of how you would define a class, like declare a class in. So I'm a camera handler class that handles like the, you know, the camera and the events and things like that. So the first thing is, notice how I, how I define that as public queue object. So every Cascades app, every Cascades object is derived from queue object. So whenever, you, whenever you're declaring your classes, you know, you'd wanna make them public uh, queue object. Uh, there's also the Q invocable that, I mean, that doesn't look like C++ syntax, and that's, that's obviously a QT syntax, and we'll talk about it very shortly. And the private slots as well, that's not C++ syntax either, so we're gonna talk about that as well uh, very shortly. And then these are all my private variables that I've defined in, in the camera handler class, so that's straight C++ code. So how did I get the camera? in my app, right, so how, right, and it's very simple, we actually have a camera control, so all you do is you include the camera control in your QML, and there you go, you have, you have camera. The camera control is an example of a custom control, so besides the controls that you have in Cascades, like, you can also expose custom controls, so the camera guys, they exposed a custom camera control. Keep in mind that when you are using a custom camera control, you need to make sure to do a QML register type in your C code to tell the, you know, to advertise that you are going to be using this camera control. Uh, otherwise, once again, it's one of those things where if you don't do that register type, it, it just won't work. You won't see anything on the screen. The other thing is notice when I touched, when I touched the, uh, the screen, uh, it took a picture. And, um, that's how you process touch, touch events. So there's an on touch uh, event that, that sort of is triggered when you touch the screen. And then I, all I'm saying is, you know, the camera control advertises a capture picture function, and there you go. It captures a fake picture. So, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward, um, hopefully. Another concept uh, that you have to be familiar with if you're developing using Qt or Cascades is signals and slots. Um, so a, a good analogy I like to use is, you know, you're going to a coffee, you're going to co a coffee shop, and obviously there's a lineup, and then you go and order your coffee, right? The guy can't give you a coffee right away, he has to make it, so he may give you a number or something, and you go to the side, and then, and then when your number's called, then you go and receive the coffee, but meanwhile the other people can also make an, make an order of, of their coffee, right? So similar idea with signals and slots obviously when you're calling invoking when you're calling a camera api it needs to go and configure the hardware and, and do all this setup and you don't want your entire app to be blocked right so a lot of the camera functions 
like many other libraries we and APIs are asynchronous. So you call a function and it returns right away. And if you want to know when it's been successfully completed, you have to register for an event. And that's how you do it. You do the queue object connect. So I'm, I'm basically, I did a camera open, so you can see the M camera open. So I, in this case, I'm actually, in this demo, I actually use a front facing camera, but in that example, it's, I open the rear facing camera. And then I want to know when the camera's been opened successfully so that I can stop the viewfinder. So I, I create a slot there on open success. And then on, when my function's called, I, I call camera start viewfinder. So, you know, it's, it's kind of pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, the other thing is, you know, when I define my header, if you look at the private slots, right, so I pointed out that keyword, and, and you may have been wondering what, what that is, because that's not C++ syntax. So whenever I am registering for events, you know, registering for slots, I have to define my functions in this private slot section. Right, so on open success, on Shutterfire, these are all my slots that I'm registering for, for like signal events. So now we talked about, so within the app as well, and let me go back to the application. I hope you don't mind being my wallpaper for a while, but. <laughs> But I kind of created this button. It's kind of ugly, but I wanted to show, show it to illustrate a concept so I can sort of stop the camera and stop the camera, right? So I'm going to show you how to handle like button events. Let me go back to the. So I create a toggle view find a button, right? And it's a regular cascades control, nothing difficult. And I give it a name called Toggle Viewfinder. And in this case, I'm using an image for the button, but you can also use text. If you're using an image, you have to create the image yourself, put it in the assets folder, and you can do it through the IDE. And then, and then it, of course, displays as the image. Within my C code, I then, so remember how I talked about cascades being a scene graph, and you, ha and you have access to the root of the scene graph. So my abstract pane is a root, and now I want to find the button within my cascade scene graph, and I find it by name. So I named it toggle viewfinder. So, so by calling that function file chi find child, it's, it's found the button, and then I, I store it in a private kind of member, member variable. And then I register a function on button click, so that's a queue invocable as well, to say, okay, when this, when this function is called, when the button is clicked, then I want to uh, call this function. And then on button click, I toggle my viewfinder. So I kind of, you know, I'll either start it or stop it. You know, so I have a variable that says, okay, if, if it's, you know, if it's running, then I stop the viewfinder. If it's not running, then I start it, right? So, um, you know, that's pretty much how you do, how you to have control logic in C++, right? Where you have your QML, uh, control, QML component defined. And another interesting aspect of this app is the, is the file system, right? So, I and mean, we are a very secure device, and you don't have access to the entire file system. So we have this concept known as an application sandbox, and that's the region of memory in which your region of the file system in which your app resides. So you have access to a few things, like the assets within your app, and some of you know some of the uh, some of the information in in these local directories. You also have access to the shared directory, so like shared camera, or you'll see shared video, or like we have this shared folder in the file system, but only if you specifically in your bar descriptor, you, you, know, you inform that, that you want access to that shared uh, directory. And then, as I said, the user gets a prompt when you, when you try to do that, and, and the user has to grant you permission to the shared folder. So, so in this case, and then to access the actual images, I just you know, use regular Qt-based uh, APIs, and uh, I create a list, and, and, and uh, that's used to populate my dropdown for the, for the images. So as I mentioned earlier, the concept of queue invocable and being able to invoke uh, you know, functions within the QML. So here's another example of how you do queue invocable. So my camera start and stop. Now I, I want, so this is an example of having the logic within your QML, right? So I want to handle the camera start and stop within my QML code. Um, and what I'm trying to do there is, so if you go back to the app, 
So I have these two tabs, right? And when I, when I change tabs, I don't necessarily want the camera running in the other tab, right? Because it, it doesn't make, you know, it, it's gonna drain the battery and it's, it, it doesn't make sense. So what I want is that when I change the tab, I stop the camera and when I go back to the camera tab, then I restart it. And, and so basically I, in my QML code, I basically have on active tab changed. And then, you know, I, if, if, if the active tab is a camera tab, I call camera start, otherwise I can call camera stop. And these, of course, are functions that are implemented in my C++ code, right? So you can kind of, this is how you can go the other way and implement some of the logic in QML, right? And advertise C++ classes and, and functions in QML. Notice the other thing is that I kind of have the underscore cam handler. Uh, so basically I've advertised my C++ object as cam handler and I do that using the set context property. So if you want to advertise a C++ object within your QML, you have to say that, you know, you have to do a QML set context property where you say my uh, camera handler object is basically I'm going to be naming, I'm going to be call, invoking it using underscore cam handler, right? So you have the set context property, cam handler, and then camera, ha camera handler. And that's, that's how I access my objects within the, within the QML. You still need the QML, the Q invocable to actually invoke those functions though. Uh, sorry, which? Oh, uh, yeah, so that was the, when I created the QML document. Yeah, so he's, he's asking about the QML itself. You're talking about that object. So it, it, when I showed you that first Cascades app, you remember I had the QML, the QML document, so that's what, that's what it is. I'm just, I'm not showing you the logic again. Yeah. So now one of the components we offer in Cascades as well is kind of the drop dropdown. Uh, and this is essentially um, when you, when you're, Accessing some of the pictures, and we'll go back to sort of the. Uh... So, if you look at this content tab, can can you? So I kind of have this drop down where I've populated my images, and it's got it from the file system, right? And then I can kind of highlight which image I want to show. And then of course, then I invoke the card to show it. Um, so this is basically a control in Cascades known as a drop down. And it's not very, it's not difficult to, the other thing is until I selected the dropdown, I didn't want to be able to, because there's nothing to view, right? Until you select the image, there's nothing to view. So you can actually, yeah, go back to the, uh, so you can actually suppress a button if you wanted, and, and it's done using the enabled, the enabled kind of flag. So I have enabled false by default, and that's the card launch button because I have nothing, until I select an image from the dropdown, I can't, I have nothing to launch, right? And then basically when I've selected something from the dropdown, you know, selected index is, is changed, and then I, I set the card launch enable flag to true, right? So this is how you can kind of, you know, disable buttons and, and things like that. Yep. That's part of the dropdown control. So yeah, so the moment, the moment I select like something, it'll, it'll uh, generate the selected index. Yeah. So obviously, how did I populate the dropdown, right? Because it's showing all these images that I've taken from the file system. So when I showed you that file system code earlier, I was basically reading the camera directory, and then I populated it into a linked list, right? Just a regular QT-based list. And then, so, so basically I go through a loop, I traverse the list, and then I just add the different uh, camera images, uh, the, the, the file names, to my using dropdown add. And then that's how, that's how you, know, you populate the dropdown. And, and it's basically a simple loop in which you then populate the fields of a dropdown, right? Um, and notice that I have this on trigger. So when the tab is, so I don't want my dropdown populated all the time because when, when I have, like when I'm taking pictures, I want it to be reflected, right, in, in the dropdown when I go to the second tab. So it's only when the dropdown, when the second view tab is triggered, then I sort of populate the dropdown. So it, it, it always refreshes the images uh, that I've taken.
So I gave an example of sort of camera as being a custom control, right? So we offer all these, all these controls as part of sort of cas you know, cascades, but then there will be times when you'll have to do a custom control, right? Can't, can't get away from it, especially if you're doing advanced stuff. So this is sort of how you declare, and I'm not going to go too much into custom control details because this is getting more into the advanced kind of uh, uh, you know, concepts, but basically the invoke target, my card is a custom control, and I sort of, you have to derive it from BB Cascades because it's custom control. And Q property lists the properties of your custom control. And you'll see in the next slide, uh, notice how, for example, the MIME type is a property, right? So you look at the first line, I have MIME, I have the read, write, and notify properties. Um, and then in the QML, when I define target, if you look at MIME, I, I basically, you know, those, those properties that I mentioned earlier, they're like the MIME, the URI, the data, they are exposed in the custom control. In order to actually use a custom control in your app, you have to register it, and I showed you that example with the camera as well, where you do a register type, you specify the, ca the custom control that you created, and then, um, and you'll all the also the library in which it's, uh, it, it's exposed in, so in this case it's invoke, and that's how you can then sort of use the custom control at that point. And then here's the fancy stuff, right? So as I said, it's really easy to invoke a card, and this is the code that does it, right? It's pretty much, I mean, it's really five lines of code, right? So um, you basically specify the target. So in this case, and this is on your dev alphas if you get it, so the card previewer is sys pictures card previewer. Um, and you should try it if, if you, you know, have some time, like try, try doing an invoke of the picture card. Uh, the action is view, so I just want to view. You can have cards that you can edit, right? So if someone wants to develop a target that's a picture editor, then I would have the action as edit. You can specify the MIME type, so in this case it's JPEGs, the camera is just taking JPEGs, so that's the format. Uh, um, and then I specify where it is, so it's in, the, it's in the file system under shared camera, right? And then you basically call invoke with your request, and there you go. It, it'll, it'll, invoke, it'll invoke the card. So, you know, invoke is a pretty powerful thing, and it doesn't take a lot of lines of code to really uh, use it. Setting the wallpaper as well is easy, and I wasn't even gonna show this code except that I wanted to mention something very specific to certain APIs, and that I wanna talk about parameters and balance, right? So anyways, this is a code to sort of set the wallpaper. It's basically you declare a home screen object, and then once you have your URI, which points to your camera image, you do a set wallpaper, right? So wallpaper's an example of one of those APIs that only works in the parameter in which you set it, right? So if, if some of you attended the keynote, you would have heard about how this, we have this whole balance thing, and you have your work parameter and your personal parameter. So if your app is installed in the personal parameter and then you call set wallpaper, it'll only set the wallpaper in the personal parameter. So whatever is in your work parameter will be unaffected. And likewise, a set wallpaper in, a, in an app installed in the work parameter will set the wallpaper in that parameter, right? And there are other APIs like this, so it's important that when you're looking through APIs, you, you're aware of the parameter implications of them because they won't work in, 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 in the parameter they're not allowed in. A lot of the PIM APIs especially, lots of security around those, so something, something you need to understand, like access control and parameters are two important security um, aspects you need to be aware of. Okay, and I'm almost done. Uh, so this was kind of my comment on parameters and how you know, wallpaper is one of, the, one of the APIs that's affected by parameters. And I guess someone inserted a slide and I wasn't aware it was there. Uh, <laughs> but basically, so you know, join the round table um, at 6 p.m. So if you have further questions on this, and I even have the code for the app, so if, if some of you want to deep dive a little bit more, I'm, I'm happy to help. And um, you know, I hope you sort of, you know, thanks for attending and I hope you guys sort of enjoyed the session. Let me see if they inserted other slides or they did. <laughs> I will, I will take the questions for sure. I just want to see how many other slides they've kind of given. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, so download the mobile conference guide. Uh, there's an appreciation event as well at 7 p.m. 
So you know, if you wanna you know party and have some fun, please, please. It's it's opposite the opposite this uh, conference center. And then your reasons to believe. Uh, so there's a 10K reasons to believe booth and jam space. You, you've heard about our whole 10K kind of promotion. So, um, so definitely, uh, I hope you participate in that. Uh, and I'll take questions. And there's a microphone there. So uh, you sort of want to use. You mentioned that there was a chance of getting a dev alpha at the conference. Right. How does one actually sign up to, is it a drawing? Or how does one kind of make, get themselves eligible to try to get their hands on one? Um, my understanding is that if you, I mean, the, the, on the conference website, there's a couple of criteria. I think if you register and you're a, you're a sort of a developer, like it should be pretty easy to get a dev alpha. If you have gotten a dev alpha before, we're not giving kind of additional dev alpha. So I, I, would, talk to, I would talk to the registration desk to find out you know, how, how, you can, how you can get one. In regards to that app you just did just now, mm -hmm. Very good question. Uh, I'm just trying to think if there's anything. You might be able to do it with all QML. I'm worried about some of the custom controls, but I think I think you might be able to. Just slow down um, by not having the some of the hint hint C plus just slow down the the, the actual app by not having the logic the way in C plus. Yeah, so QML is kind of a, a lay on top of the C++, right? So you have to be careful about performance. I don't know if it'll slow things down too much in this app, to be honest. Okay. But, but for more complicated apps, then, then for sure, like, it could start to slow down. Can you say a little bit more about uh, how the application security model <coughs> works between the app in the App Store and how, uh, how the data security works? Um, so, yeah, so you're talking about like the application sandbox, I guess? Yeah, yeah. So far, I've heard nothing about security in any of the talks I've sat in so far. So OK. I so there's different levels of security, right? So the first is we just protect the application in a sandbox, right? So, so if, you, if you try to access, to, you know, if you have null pointers and things like that, the system will bring your app down and it doesn't affect anyone else. You also can't create directories on the file system and you can't do any of that uh, within your application. So, so you're pretty much in your own little sandbox and you're completely secured from the file system and from interfering with other applications. Then there's another type of security, which is the whole idea of parameters, right? Where Parameters, you can almost see it as it's, it's two different, um, there's two different like file systems on the device almost, like two different memory partitions. You can look at it as a, as a partition. And so, you know, you can have all these parameter, like all these enterprise parameter apps in one partition and they're completely, and, and all the personal parameter apps are in a different partition and they're just not aware of each other at all. Uh, so there's, there's, there's those different levels of security. So it's very difficult to kind of thrash the system. So how about device ID or application IDs? How do I know when people uh, buy one of my apps from the App Store? How do I communicate with them? How do I register them in my own, with my own service in the back end? Well, so a lot of the enterprise apps, they're kind of, they have to be installed through IT policies and things like that, right? So typically a lot of the apps you develop will be on the personal parameter. You will have to get special signing authority to have an app on the enterprise parameter uh, in most cases. In terms of advertising your, that your app works on the enterprise parameter, I'm not 100% I'm not sure of the answer to that. Maybe, maybe the app wall guys may have some more, some more insight. Well, even, even just on the consumer side of the device, so let's say I put an app up in the App Store, and uh, this app uses my service. So let's say, you know, it's you know the Facebook app. Right. Facebook wants to communicate notifications to me. How does it reach me? How does it know? What is the identifier it uses to interact? You know, to send notifications to the app that's been downloaded to the device. So there are, there are, 
like for example, like through the bar descriptor you have, like you have an identifier for your app, and and like you saw how I invoke the preview as well, right? So if it knows it, if it knows your app, it can it can you know it can then send messages to it. Uh, the other ways you can advertise your app as an invocation target. So once again, then the invocation system can so if someone can query the invocation system to get sort of your application. Are there only going to be two perimeters, say in like tablet devices where you might share it with your family, set up a separate partition? So I'm aware of the enterprise and the and the personal parameter for now. Uh, whether we'll introduce uh, you know additional parameters like like you talk about a shared. Per so the enterprise parameter does have certain privileges that the personal parameter doesn't. So a lot of the en param the enterprise parameter away APIs may be able to access the personal parameter. It doesn't go the other way. So you're talking about some shared parameter where you can access both. I guess is that or just. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if, if you can do that right now through balance, but. Yeah. Look over to the microphone because I'm kind of <laughs> far away. <laughs> So in the current BlackBerry 7 OS, when I download an application, I can set the application permissions. Um, I noticed here that we had the option to set it in the bar file as a developer, but as a user, am I still able to you know, arbitrarily deny Google Maps access to my personal information when I use it for a day? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh -huh. so that's why we force, like if, you're, if, if an app is going to use APIs that we think will be, have security implications, mm -hmm. uh, they'll always get a prompt. So you have to, as an app, you have to say, OK, I want to use a camera in the file system. Uh -huh. So when, when he launches the app, he'll get like a prompt saying this app wants to use your, you know, the file system, and you can deny it. Mm -hmm. Once you deny, once you, well, if you deny it, then it's denied, obviously. If you say OK, it's, that setting is saved, but you can go later and override it. So okay. I can then later say, you know what, I only wanted this app to have it for, for this, this time, and, and in the future, it can't access it. So it behaves similarly to how it is today. I can choose what I want to give the app access to. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So um, I've seen that uh, Cascade is a, a framework that was built on top of uh, Qt. Um, but as, as far as I've seen, the, the only things that uh, Cascade have added to, to the Qt is the uh, visualization, the, the effects. But uh, what else does Cascade uh, provide me that I, I can't do uh, with Qt? Well. So I mean, you a, a lot of the Cascades flow and the Cascades peak and all that functionality, um, you wouldn't be able, like if you're talking about Qt GUI, for example, you might not have access to a lot of that, right? I mean, that's all built into Cascades. Uh, if you're just talking about visuals and creating like, you know, you could probably emulate a lot using maybe Qt GUI or, or stuff like that. But but some of the more like, the, the more Blackberry specific kind of UX, you know, control and feel, uh, that's, uh, that you'd obviously have to use Cascades for that. There's nothing preventing someone from going out and trying to like be on the website, for example, they manage to mimic a lot of a lot of that, you know, in you know, using a lot of the web controls. But uh, for now, you know, you'd have to use Cascades if you wanted that functionality. We also have a lot of proprietary extensions that we add, right? So we don't necessarily we support a lot of the cute mobility APIs, but we also add a lot of extensions to it, like. Like in certain cases, it doesn't make sense for us to like NFC, for example. We're not using the cute NFC because we have a lot of so we we have certain things we want to expose, for example. So, um, so we are not so you know we support cute and we support the whole concept of it. But in certain cases, we we add a lot of additional functionality that's BlackBerry specific. I have a question regarding the IDE that you recommend uh, for this, um, and if there is multiple, then. What are the pros and cons at this point? And also, if you can talk a little bit about the user controls that are, all you had a slide, but I think it went by very quickly. That would be great. Um, so you're talking about like using Cascades Builder? Uh, what type of user controls that are available in Cascades that we can okay. take advantage of? So I mean, I had kind of a, so, so you can create like a lot of, a lot of the straightforward like 
controls like buttons and I'll just bring down and bring up that slide so you can take a look. And I don't know, I think these slides might also be made available to you guys later. So. Yeah, so there, that's the slide. So you can do also advanced stuff like lists and, and you know, activity indicators, dividers of images, progress indicators. We have a lot of documentation on our Cascade site, so like absolutely you'll, you'll see a lot of those. What about the IDEs? Are, they, are these available in all the IDEs? And well, the, so, so it's not available through our Visual Studio plugin, right? So that's, we've geared that more towards game developers, uh, not so much towards Cascade developers. But if you launch the, if you install the BlackBerry 10 IDE, uh, then you'll have Cascades Builder and you'll have the controls. And not only that, you can kind of graphically drag and drop, you know, the controls into your QML and it'll generate the QML code for you. When taking a QT um, sample, um, something similar to a rotation, so of, of kind of a rotation, I'm looking to do um, rotating of a coin, um, that QML doesn't ha actually have per se yet. Um, how do I take that QT sample and compile it into a, a, um, a QML type thing? Um, how do I compile it into QML? Is it something that can be possibly done yet, or does it have to be loaded, or do you guys have to actually load it in QML first for the QT to be able to be used in there? You would, it would be very similar to how I showed it with Cascades. It it's basically, you know, it's, it's, Cascades is based on QT, right? So uh, all the libraries and everything are in there. How do you handle uh, programmatically uh, defining the UI? Um, you know how you iterate through the list, but say I wanted to have conditional branches and controls within that. How do you dynamically create it using programmatically? So you're talking about like dynamically creating a page or something like that. Um, so that's where you get into the navigation panes and, 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 and things like that, right? So, um, so you, can, you can create, you can define your multiple pages and your multiple panes and then and then you sort of, uh, you know, it's a way you set up your scene graph and um, you can, based on certain actions, you can navigate through a, to a new pane. I don't know, that kind of makes sense. Exactly, exactly, depending on the actions and the, and the, the user input. Okay, does, well, does I guess QT last question any, and then we'll wrap Does up. QT have any sort of bindings for like binding data to lists so you don't have to manually wire together all this data? So you're talking about like exposing C++ objects in QT and that, that sort of stuff? Say if you had your drop down list and you had some data, list data structure you just want to say, okay, list, use this data structure and oh. fill in all the values using a template or whatever. So you don't want to go through, like, iterating through the list. You just right. want to, I don't think, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there's any QML QT experts here, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if you can do that. You, you probably have to iterate. Uh, can you? All right. I guess, well, thank you for your time, and we'll... Yeah.